book launch of Harmaka TV. Um, today, I'm very excited to I'm very excited about this book. Uh, it's a fictional novel, Tale of a Bones Wife, and we are ble uh, blessed to have the author, Fortuma Kuso. My name is Shukri Guchir. I'm from Hormaki TV, and I will be your host for this evening. Um, I'm not really interviewing Fortuma. She's uh, extremely eloquent. She's going to speak about the book. Today is about the, the novel, uh, Tale of a Bones Wife. And uh, this interview was conducted in Mokodisha's uh, book fair, the third annual book launch 2017, back in September. It was conducted in Somali. So today's discussion will be in English. Lucky for you guys. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, uh, Fortuma uh, has immigrated to Canada um, at the break of the Civil War from Somalia back in 1991. When she came to Canada, believe it or not, she was an ESL student. Did not speak a word of English, according to Fortuma, which I am questioning the idea now. And today, she's a published author. Not only is she a published author, she is an English teacher. So. <laughs> That's extremely amazing. Uh, for Tuma, like uh, uh, Mama Nakrum already introduced, she was born in Somalia, Bedabo. She is uh, the youngest of seven children, uh, one of two uh, girls in her family. So not only is she one of two girls, she's the youngest, so I'm assuming you're spoiled, yeah? <laughs> her parents were uh, farm people, very simple people, uh, but nevertheless, they put high importance that Fortuma and her sister had equal opportunity as equal as her brothers did. Um, so without further ado, I'll let the author uh, take over and uh, to basically uh, talk about the book, Fortuma. Uh, the first thing that popped at me when I touched this novel is the title of the book. So basically, um, I want to ask you, the main character on the book, her name is Ibn. But this was not Ibn's tale. This is the tale of a bone's wife, so somebody's wife. Why that title? Um, thank you. In the context of Somali culture, everybody is their father's child. And that's the only time that the term that refers to male and female is the same. I, for example, would be in a Mohammed Kuso, and my brother would be the same. So, um, and that's to preserve tribal lineage, which is goes through your father. And every child is, is taught to know the tribal lineage. I can start now and count 50, 60 names down the line until I get to what we consider to be the top guy of that tribe. So. The, the reason this book is called Tales Born, uh, uh, Tale of Bones Wife is if you marry a born person, whether it's a boy or a girl, essentially you lose the right to be your father's child. So the idea is, um, in this context, tribe is everything. They're your health insurance, they're your car insurance. If you go and break somebody's arm, and they pay the compensation. If you get a car accident, your tribe pays for that. If you get married, your tribe gets the dowry. If you get divorced, your tribe's the people you go to to get uh, your rights for you. So uh, this girl, for marrying the man she was not supposed to, she loses the right to be um, her father's child. Not only according to her parents, but socially, that right is lost. So anybody who's referring to her, even in the neighborhood, would call her, oh, she is the one who's married to the bone. She is the bone's wife. She'll never be her father's child, even if she divorces the man, even if the man dies. So that's why the title, even in a sense of marrying this man, has no right to be um, Hussein Amy's daughter anymore. So she is a bone's wife. And that's why the title is there. 
Wow, um, I'm learning something new. What about uh, the case, no seriously, what about the case that, what if the father blesses his daughter, regardless of the man's uh, tribe? Let's say he's a good Muslim man, first of all. Second of all, he is Somali. He speaks the same language. Then what happens to the daughter's name? Um, in Somali, we have this idea of what we really say publicly and what we would do when, when things need to be done. So everybody will tell you if somebody is Muslim, if somebody is a decent person, you're okay to marry them. But no father would bless a daughter or a son to marry. If he was from bliss tribe, he wouldn't bless his daughter Mary and try. And even if it happens here in North America, people wouldn't do that, although they tell you they're okay with it, you can marry a Muslim person, it doesn't happen. But even if the father blessed it, socially, nobody will refer you to that father's child anymore. You become the bonus wife. And the tribe will withdraw all their support, even if your parents are okay with it. Your parents end up risking their reputation, their title, their standing within the tribe for agreeing with it. And if they even agree, that support from the tribe will be withdrawn. So the whole idea of, um, you know, you can marry who you want if they're a decent Muslim person. You know, our former government tried that. We, I remember being a school age girl and us going out and actually burying and burning the tribe or what was supposed to be a symbol of the tribe. But it just wore a suit and it was just a different, different version. So it, it, it never really goes away and we like to tell ourselves. And even now our government system is based on 4.5. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Fortuma. You know, um, this, is, this topic is a stigma. We know it does exist, tribalism, and there are uh, different levels of society within uh, the Somali community, whether they are the diaspora or the people that are still living in Somalia. But why did you, why did you choose this topic? What, did the topic choose you? Or did you choose to talk about this topic? Um, if I was talking to a group of other writers, I would have been brave enough to say the topic chose me because otherwise, because if you're not a writer, you would think that's a crazy idea to come up with. But in my mind, I think um, the writing should make people feel good about themselves. You should read about you know, romantic relationships. But among other things, writing should make people uncomfortable enough to ask the question, what are we doing? So that's number one. And I, when, when I started this story, I remember seeing two young boys that looked distinctly what you would consider to be born on TV. They were both accused of stealing something. And the condition was they would lose a hand or something like that. And I remember thinking, if those two boys were from the right tribe, this punishment would not have taken place. So it's for me to show that we are here in Somalia and any other society that practices the whole idea of othering others, saying those people are bad, different from us, have questions to ask about themselves. How did we get here? And we didn't get here because we were good people and just God's punishing us for something. We got here because we created a situation that's not, that's not a winning situation. So I, was, I, I wanted to bring the middle a little bit closer than it is, so all of us can ask the uncomfortable question of what we did and how we arrived where we are. In the novel, there seems to be um, a social distinction between the two groups, the, I guess the elite and the, the others or um, as you stated in the novel, the bliss group and the uh, born group. There's a social distinction. But there seems to be, um, even the main character is not really understanding, she cannot grasp that idea. Um, clearly, Idil accepts on certain level when she's a, a, a little girl, the born people are less than she is. So that she accepts like everybody else in her community. But 
the image of born people that's presented to her, mainly by her mother, is people that are ugly, backward, degenerate, not kind enough. Um, you know, at some point her mother calls, they are the first cousin to the African apes. So all those ideas are implanted in Idris' mind. So if somebody is really degenerate, not smart, ugly, similar to the apes, you should accept they're not really as human as you are. So on that level, Idris accepts. Then she faces the conflict when she meets this really smart, kind, handsome young man who's very supportive of her. Then that whole idea of what born is and what they really are, it's conflicting. And she has a hard time, even it takes her a long time for somebody to clearly address it, that this man is what would be considered a born person. So that's the conflict she is, because she accepts on some level the born is less, but that's only the image that was implanted on her. So when that image is in question, then the whole idea of what her society teaches is in question. Wow, um, how does that differ from the colonizers' mentality? When the Europeans came to Africa, or founders, as they say, there's people that lived in the land, but the narrative that, that was given from Africa was that they're savages, naked people, less than. So in this context, people do look the same, they speak the same language. How does this differ from that culture of the European uh, superiority or that, um, that was done by, by the colonizers compared to when it's done by your own people? Uh, I'm not sure how different is one from the other. It's the whole idea of feeling better based on how better you are from the other person. So I'm not sure if this is something left from the colonizers or something that was created within that society, but the whole idea comes where um, somebody is uh, the other than you are, whether that's based on a gender or, or religious differences or skin color or tribal differences. It's when, you, when you're from an outside, it's crazy to think somebody considers themselves a little bit more African than the other. For example, the whole story goes like this, right? So somebody goes, and, and uh, they were told if you travel and if you find that animal, you can eat as long as you're hungry and you don't take a piece of that um, with you. So one of them takes a piece of that meat and when they make it back home, that one is disowned and therefore he becomes a midgan because he did this and this. And somebody's looking a little bit more African. So the whole idea is ludicrous. It, and it would be really funny if it wasn't tragic. Right, so the tragedy is still there in the, in the country. So the whole idea is like creating, you could tell, whether it was created by Westerners or within Somalia, for somebody to feel better or to advance themselves than the other group. In the novel, uh, there is uh, the initial meeting uh, when uh, the mother gets to meet Sido. And uh, I would like for you to please uh, read from uh, pages uh, 54, um, about how that whole uh, meeting went down and the reaction of uh, Ida's mom. So, um, this is at a point where mother comes upon the kids playing at home and Sido is um, drawing. And, and this is the first time that the, that the daughter hears that Sido is not what she thought he was. I talked for a long time, swept away by the memory of my experience of the magnificent waterfall, and see those drawings materialized across the surface of the paper. Okay, let me see. He lifted the page, holding it before me. Here, I gasped. In the center of the drawing was a lone swimmer leaping out of the whirlpool, hands outstretched, smiling broadly, Water ran down his body in, in long streaks. His dark skin shone against the clear water, and the droplets on his tight curls glittered like diamond dust. 
On the cliff overlooking the water, Cyril drew a line of children clubbing to mark the victory of the first swimmer to reach the surface. Below that image, they watched another in mid-flight, a cannonball hurling toward the whirlpool. The images, refined and innocent, filled me with joy. He extended the pad toward me. It's yours. My hand shook as I reached for it. This is the best gift I've ever had. I was still wrapped in the marvel of my beautiful gift when mother entered the room. She had made, she had made her way up the stairs and into the room without making a sound and was upon me before she spoke. What do you think you're doing? She grabbed me by the elbow and dragged me away from Cedo. This is what you spent your whole day doing with him here and your brother involved? Elmi was already retreating to his room. Cedo moved toward the door, ready for a quick getaway, but he didn't leave. Mother waved her hand, encompassing the area. You have everything, and all you want is to bring him here? She took the drawing and held it away from her face. What is this? Saliva flew out of her mouth and spattered the page. He needs to go home. Mother knew Cito's name, but she refused to dignify him with it. He is leaving right now. Cito is slunk away, a wounded animal, without saying goodbye. I wanted to run after him and take back the pain, wipe the tears I knew were inside, even if his cheeks were dry. Sorry, I called after him as a cheap substitute. Mother clenched her fists. I don't want to see you anywhere near that boy or the likes of him again. Why? Ask why again I'll send you to Timbuktu. The first time Mother uttered that threat, I was four years old and believed Timbuktu was a place where young girls died. At 14, I would have gone to Timbuktu rather than sever my friendship with Cedo. I ran out of the room. Mother didn't stop me. The next morning at the school, a cloud of sadness surrounded me. At recess, I sat on the rock bench at the far corner of the yard. Even after I was invited to join the girls in a game of skipping, I remained blocking the grass beneath my feet. Sido left the soccer game and stood next to me. I know your mother doesn't want her precious daughter playing with a bone. You are a bone? The revelation shook me. I believed the bone people to be slaves for those from my clan, the blessed. Mother had explained more than once that they were ugly and their brains were smaller than ours. Yes, he said. Sido was like other boys, if not better. He was very smart, and his refined image contradicted the picture I had of the bone people as hideous and backward. But you are smart, handsome, and kind. See those gaze landed hard upon me, covering me, my whole body within a smothering stare. What did you expect? I couldn't tell him about the bone image imprinted on my mind from the time I could walk. I was told that bone people have white noses, large lips, and darker skin, that they are the first cousins of African apes. Mother often explained to me how my grandfather owned bone slaves. But you are, you look so different, I sputtered. Sido couldn't belong to any bone tribe. He didn't fit mother's account of how stupid and degenerate they were. I gathered my leftover lunch and went back to class. That's amazing. What did you expect? What did you expect? He's a human being with the same color as, as Ibn. Um, I've taken a lot from, from just that, those two pages. Because, unfortunately, this is a fact that does exist. And the images that, and the stories kids are told from a young age we see that racism is a learned habit, is not uh, something a child is born with. 
uh, human beings can fall in love regardless of uh, their tribe, their background, and so on. I, it, I know you, <laughs> you said it's not a romantic love story, but to me, it sounds very uh, romantic. Um, there is a clear, um, a very clear uh, relationship between uh, the women that it's very, there's a lot of conflicts between the women. Also, uh, unfortunately, Eden's father, um, Mr. Elmi, is having uh, an affair, and uh, the mother seems to be, um, like for, for what it is in the beginning, that, that the idea that a woman should be tamed. Uh, so, could you please illustrate on that, that why is Ida's mom enforcing Eden to accept the idea that the best thing a, wo a woman, th the best thing for a woman is for her to be tamed? Um, relationship between the woman in the book is um, a little bit complicated, and it's not straightforward where um, they don't um, like each other or um, they want to hurt each other. But in Idil's mother's mind, convincing Idil to, um, to forget about this man she loves and marry the one that the, choose from the list of, of suitable maids that her mother lists is the best option for her to survive because her mother knows something unfortunately Idil doesn't know at 17 that um, choosing what you want is not as wise and as safe as what you, what you must do. And the women are kind of like paralleled where um, Idil's mother decides to accept what's socially acceptable while Idil, Idil, um, Idil decides not to accept it. And on the other side, Rhoda, who marries Idil's brother, accepts what's socially allowed and Idil doesn't. So then at the end of the day, when you look to, at the end of the book, then you have to ask yourself, which of these women is making the right decision? Right, so making the right decision is not what we would consider the right decision in our 2017 you know, North American mindset. So making the right decision might be what decision would allow somebody to survive? Not only Idris' mother, but even Sido's mother doesn't like her, her son to marry this woman because she knows what the outcome would be. But at 17, they don't know. And at some point, so Idris' mother never says, this is better for you. She says, this is what you should do to survive. And the idea is, um, you know, the mother believes any woman that follows her heart is a danger to herself. And she wants to make sure her daughter is safe, therefore following your head is what's safer for you. So Evelyn's mind is not really a um, really bad mother or a, or a mean mother trying to cut her daughter off from the love, but she knows that would never work. What her daughter wants would never work. In other words, she's basically protecting her daughter from facing uh, society's uh, difficulties because you don't only have to deal with your uh, families when you get married, you have to deal with the society at large. And so basically she's protecting her from that. Uh, but unfortunately at 17 and being in love, <laughs> that's, you don't understand it that way. Um, I would like for you to please read uh, from uh, page 53. There's a lot of passage. So this is after that incident where um, the mother came and bond this drawing. Um, so this is on, um, so she says, later that night when I was in bed, she came to me. Evil, she pulled the chair from under my desk and sat. I do what I do to protect you from you. A girl who follows her heart is a great danger to herself. Please use your head. If seeing Sido was dangerous, I didn't want to be saved. I told mother that, but she only sighed and left. 
So that's to show Idris mother that is not really being callous and she's not trying to um, push her daughter to something that she doesn't want to. She thinks this would be the safe course of action to take. Uh, the 17-year-old Idil uh, seems a very mature, uh, well-rounded um, girl, not like a, uh, like a teenager that's not mature. That's the way I just imagined her, very mature for her age. And she, she decided to come up with her own conclusion. I, I think her maturity is, um, is, a, is, a, is a cultural thing. Right? Anybody who grew up in Somalia knows you were just a grown person by the time you were 14. Especially for women, most girls got married at 15 or 16. So in that context, it is, and she's a little bit mature than, than, than her age, but um, clearly from the first scene of the book, it would be one of those girls or one of those children that could not be tamed. So, and she's not going to conform and she's not going to follow the social rules. That's very clear from the beginning of the book. But, um, but she is mature. Partly, she's maybe smart, she's very sensitive, but partly she is the product of her culture where at 17, you're an adult. It's not like North America where 18 year olds are still children. So it's a different context and different culture that partly reduced her maturity and partly is a personality. Awesome. I would like for you to address uh, the, the challenges that women face uh, in this novel. It, it must, some of it is similar, but it's different at the same time, that relationship and conflict between the two age groups. Um, there is a lot of challenges for, um, for the women in the book. And the challenges are, some of them are brought by the war, some of them are brought by um, the social conditions that they found themselves. And some of them are brought by the situations they're in. So at some point the father, either his father, is, is having um, these continuous affairs that never end. And Idris is having a difficult time why every time her father has an affair, it's always the mistress's fault. So she doesn't really get that, and they're always saying it's woman's fault. If there was no woman flaunting, they wouldn't, he wouldn't go after it. It's, it's the woman's fault. And she asks at one point, and she says, you know, and her mother is trying to go through all these rituals of getting her husband back, and it's not, it's never really the husband's fault. So she asks why it's always the woman's fault. What happened when he finds the next one, right? And her mother says, admitting that it's your husband's fault means you couldn't keep your husband happy. So it's easier to blame the other woman and say it's the mistress's fault. And that, I think, has, is not something that's specific to um, to, to only Somali women, it might be cutting across cultures and, and seeing that, you know, we, I teach at high school and we still have that. If there's something happens between a boy and a girl, it's always the girl's fault, right? We have a, we have a nice term for um, a young high school student who has several girlfriends and we have non-unforgiving term for a girl that has, um, you know, more than one, one date. So it's, it's, the, mainly about the conflict between the genders, but, but at the same time, it has this idea of, you know, Idris' mother was raised by a stepmother, so she doesn't want to leave the kids and have them be raised by a stepmother, and she's too proud to accept that her husband is, she can't keep him happy, therefore he's finding himself in one, another woman's bed to another to another. So now it's easier to say it's the woman's fault and accept the blame. Amazing. Uh, I want to remind you guys, this is a fictional uh, story. <laughs> uh, so it's extremely interesting, uh, this topic. Uh, what do you want the readers to take away? Basically, I think everybody's going to take different things from this novel. What would you like the reader to take away from this novel for Tuma? Yeah, you're right, every reader would take something different, but 
if I could pick one thing, perhaps it would be understanding the idea of that we all have parts to play when we treat people day or the other. And all of us have certain level of that responsibility, but asking the question and looking, looking into it and deciding where does this term come from and the all inequality and challenge that it presents. It's in our country here, it's back home where some of us came from, so it's everywhere. So the idea of looking at um, the danger that could be um, had by treating be other people as others. Thank you so much, Fortuma. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, the book is here, the author is here. If you're hooked, pick up your book and you will get the chance for the author to do the book signing for you here. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our sponsors today at Ista Restaurant, Hood Hood, of course, um, and uh, the publisher, uh, Second Story Press, are here. Thank you, girls. And um, yeah. This is exciting, and um, I would also like to open a question session for the audience. Uh, if anybody has a question, my co-host, uh, the lovely Deqa Noor in the green will be uh, facilitating that. If anybody has questions, please come uh, forward. Questions for the author. Hello, hello? Yeah. Hi. Say your name, please. Say your question. Assalamu alaikum. Congratulations. Um, this is an amazing uh, achievement. And uh, my question to you is how long did it take you? What was your process like um, in terms of writing this amazing story? And I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, so how long did it take you? What was the process like? Um, and you know, is there another book that's coming? Is it a sequel? I mean, I haven't read it, so I can't really say. So is it a sequel? We're gonna see Idol in a different phase, or are you working on a new book? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the whole process from when I started to today has taken six years. So writing the book, because I have a full-time job and a part-time job, and I have family, and <laughs> some of my kids are here. And um, so um, I, I was writing about maybe an hour, two hours a night after work. Um, so it took me about three and a half years to write it, um, close to four years, and then editing. And then it took me about a um, year and a half or so to find somebody willing to publish it. And um, I started with, um, so, and I don't know if anybody here, the lady who asked is writing. I don't write, I don't plot. I just go there and write, and write, and write. And what I write, if I write, you know, a thousand words, I might delete 700 of that next night. So um, I'm just going in circles. Sometimes the characters are talking in my head, and I wake up and I just start writing. Um, so it's sometimes I'm driving the car and I'm talking to myself, kind of like pretending to be different characters. So those are the processes. And, um, and I first thought, started with doing with literary agents, trying to write to them letters and trying to, so you write a letter, query letter, and cover pages, sample, send it to them. So, um, so I continue to send it, agents in New York, agents in Toronto, agents in the UK. So I received, 104 projections for it. So um, when I received 104 projections for it, and then I decided, okay, now I'm going to try, and um, small publishers, because usually big publishers, they don't deal with the authors directly. They, you have to have an agent to take their work to them. So I decided I was gonna go with the small publishers, and then I sent the three publishers. Uh, one didn't respond, one rejected it, and second story press picked it. So once they decided to publish it, it took a year of really, really around the clock working and editing and revising and back and forth and disagreeing and agreeing and disagreeing and agreeing and ripping. Like I would have, let's say, four weeks to read, and it's almost 400 pages, it was 95,000 words. 
So I would have four or five weeks to do major revisions and, um, and I'm going crazy and calling my kids and saying that, okay, my life is over, I can't do this. And then calming me down saying that, no, no, you can get through it, just, just, just stop. Or losing the file with editing and calling somebody and saying that, I lost my file, how can I get it? It's in the computer. So yeah, so it took basically six years all, um, all of it. And I'm working in another book, it's not a sequel. Um, so it's maybe a year into it, maybe a couple more years or more, one more year to do it, but I'm in a different story, different book. This one will, might have a sequel, but not for another couple of years, because I'm working on another one now. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question. I had somebody who put their hand up. Come on down. Thank you. Um, I would like to give a special thanks to Talk Talk, um, basically um, confronting the narrative. Um, Hassan is here. Uh, he facilitated this amazing uh, meeting. I'd like to give a special a special thanks to him. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so we have another from Marka TV. I have Somali and Kuala. This is a Somali time. Bohanka to Sanai, Guruka, Kashakaya, and my staff Kashakaya, or Marka TV. وحنمر كورا بينا نوم هاد عليو أباش صور محمد على أمريكا وعاو هل كان غفريا ويلكم باك طلبات كوالا وراشي أو بوكا قرطي وواهم بغينا يا نبرا وان سو أشي أنا بينا كويتي وحيت هاي يا كوكو دلي فكر كائنات بوكا قرطو إلان تادي ماج علي قرطو ما كوو إنكرج كري سيكو كان تفكر كا طلبات سو أشي لبادا بينا كويتي وحيت هاي Thank you. Um, so the question was, um, one part of it was, um, why, why did you decide to write? What encouraged you or, or gave you the idea to write? And, um, and, and the other question was, why did you not write the book in Somali, the first, first section of it? So um, what got me into writing, I don't know. I think um, I, was, I think I was born to write because I, um, I remember my sister who is um, you know, one of my greatest supporters. She's the oldest. I have five brothers and I'm the youngest. My parents often said they kept on trying for a girl, that's why they had five boys. They had no intention of having boys. <laughs> that irritated my brothers too much, but that was the story my father told all the time when they, when they, when they made him angry. So anyway, um, my sister gave me a notebook. She went to do her master's in India, and she gave me a notebook with you know, um, images of Lahore burnt it on it, and that was my first notebook. And I started writing mainly because I really, really, really wasn't good at socializing with people. Like I didn't know what you said in the yard was not what you told the teacher. That just, that just, I lost that idea. So I never kept friends. And I couldn't, and I was not coordinated enough to play soccer, that's what everybody played. So writing was the thing I had that I could excel. So I wrote, and my first, novel called Amran, written in Somali, was published and serialized in October start in 1984, right after I turned. And, uh, and I'm going to claim I was the only woman that had fiction work published on that paper in existence. Mana Fai was right before me, and translation of The Roots was right after me, and I was in the middle, and I was only 16 years old. So that, um, I have a copy of that, just thankfully, um, um, Library of Congress in the States keeps a copy, every word, no matter what language it's, it's published, written, a copy of it. So I was able to get a copy of the paper from the Library of Congress, so I have it. I'm going to try and find somebody to edit it, and it will come out hopefully in the Mogadishu book fair next year. That's the hope, that's written in Somali. The second question is why wasn't this book written in Somali? Um, 
because I want the audience for this book to be more than Somali people. Also, I know, I, I'm gonna praise myself here, but if I wrote enough Somali, most Somali people that are under 35 wouldn't be able to read and understand it. Because the language is eroded and the instructions even within Somalia are done in different language than of Somali. So if I wrote the book, it would not really read audience that I wanted to reach. And I wanted the book to be not only Somali story, but also to be a human story. The whole idea of whether it's a question for the way we treat people of different genders, of different orientations, of different skin color, or different religion. When we other people, the problem it leads to, and it could apply to the way we treat ourselves in Canada or anywhere else. So that's the reason also, I wasn't really sure if I would have, like this book, once it went to the publisher, it went through five, six different people to edit it. I didn't know if I would have enough people to edit it, enough Somali, so hopefully I will have somebody who's really, really good enough Somali and really, really good in English that would be able to work with the publisher and translate it, and people who can only read that would be able to read it that way. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Question? Yes, sister, come down, please. Say your name, please, and your question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Warda. Um, I'm really excited to go home and read the book. Um, I love stories that are. First of all, as Somalis, we're very conscious of the injustices that happen to us, whether it's in the diaspora or in the international uh, arena. But a lot of times, we don't focus on the in internal injustices, specifically the Qabil issues, right? So my question to you is like, so far, the people that know of your story, whether it's family and friends and whatnot, how ha what was their reaction to you kind of, uh, um, I don't know, airing out the laundry kind of a thing because a lot of times we're like you know what like anything that is a taboo or anything that is um problematic we kind of put it on the back burner and kind of hide it and we are one people and we are one language and it's very idealistic view of who we are that's my question like what has been the reaction so far thank you Um, as far as my family goes, I, um, my family really, really, really love me, so they would like everything I write, <laughs> right? It's like, um, you know, I have five children, my children do not think I do wrong, even if I do wrong, so that's, that's a good thing. And, um, but the, the reaction of it, um, has been really good, people that read it, and, um, but most of people that reviewed it, at least what I could see, um, are, not, are not from the Somali community. So I'm counting on people that are buying tonight to have their, their, their review. Um, some people will agree, some people will, uh, will disagree with the idea that's there. But, um, but at least it will start the discussion of the question, like you said, I, I, um, you know, sometimes you hear we are one people, one language. I'm always tweeting back. There's more than one language in the country, right? There is, um, you know, it's, and, um, and, you know, we can, we can maybe agree on we have the same religion on some level, but even that we might say, you know, who is, you know, because I could say, you know, I'm from a tribe where people are more scholarly in the religion than other tribes, right? And I could say that I memorized the Quran by the time I was 13, but that's kind of, even that becomes a question, but I'm hoping that people would see it's not a target on anybody. I tried to um, kind of like disguise a couple of the main cities that they take so every Somali person could see themselves in it. But if you know, you could see where the story is going, but whoever that, anybody who reviewed it so far has liked it and, and had really good things to say about it, but then I'm gonna count on you to bring with whole, your whole idea of 
um, Somaliness and the conflict between whether we think we're one, but we're really, you know, officially, Somalia is the only country where its president would publicly admit some of us are only half the people. Just think about that for a minute. We have four and a half system. So it's not really hidden. It's, it's beyond what's going on in America. People are saying, you know, four groups are getting one part of these, but one of these groups would see other. That term other is actually publicly, officially used in uh, documents that decided to establish who gets what seat in the government. So I think that question should at least, the book should at least give us all the way to ask the question. Okay. Uh, question, please. Okay, we have a question coming up. Okay, good. You guys can put your hands up so that at least I know. Don't be shy. Yeah, I can say one, two, three, and then go all by order. Hi, can you say? Please say your name and then your question, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Marco Juarez, so uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank you for coming and for bringing your book. Uh, I'm really excited, as my friend said, to go home with it and read it and share these kind of stories uh, that are coming from our community with um, my kids and my family. And yeah, so, um, so my question to you is that um, the youth and the young people uh, in the diaspora how could they see themselves in this story? Because I know the story of the bone, we hear about it, and we know it's so real. Sometimes um, we like to put it in the, in the closet and pretend like it doesn't really exist. Uh, but we know these things are also impacting the youth in our community. Um, the, we hear of stories um, that these things are happening as well. So I'm just wondering, how do you think the youth uh, um, in the diaspora see could they see themselves in the story? And if they do, how do you think it would impact them? Or how could it help them advocate for themselves or uh, change their views um, and that sort of thing? Sorry. It's like a loaded question. And I feel like I'm asking multiple questions at the same time. I'm really sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I am hoping, especially people that are here, in North America, we're all clear on um, what it feels like to be judged as the other, right? So that's very, maybe somebody in Somalia might not realize it, but when we're here, you know you are, um, why you're judged based on what you look like at some points. People might not know you, they might not speak to you, and, um, and, and that happens to me all the time. It happens to you the younger you are, it might be different. So the idea is um, the story is set in a way that it transcends the idea of even looking at this tribe and that tribe and it shows you the ramifications for everybody of when we just decide this person is the other, therefore doesn't deserve the protection, doesn't deserve the rights, doesn't deserve to be ignored, to be included, to be part of the family, right? We, we, once we decide that, then we can see what the ramification is. And I think young people here should be able to see we don't want, we're really ready to jump up and down, and kind of um, be supported if we realize we're being carded based on our skin color, or the age we are, or, or, or whatever the case might be. So I think young people, should, it should be easier for them if they read it to see, you know, um, the idea of othering others has its problem. And it's not only something we see in North America, it happens in Somalia, in black and color, in the government documents and all that. So it should be easier for young people to see themselves and decide you know, if I wanted the right for myself, I should be able to, to have it too and kind of like deal with it here where we are. Um, I have a friend who was gonna marry this girl. His parents told her he was Midgan 
and he decided to marry a girl from Sri Lanka, although he was gonna, he liked this other girl, he was gonna marry that Somali. So it happens here, but we don't wanna admit it, so I think the young people would be able to admit and say, at least I'm not going to participate in this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have one question, okay, two questions. Oh, three questions. Okay, after that, we're gonna wrap it up because we have the food that we don't want it to get cold. Like, we're gonna wrap it up. I have three people, hi. Come on down, please say your name and your question, please. My name is Fatima, and this isn't really a question rather than an endorsement. I was really lucky to be working at Second Story Press when Fatima's, uh, Fatima's book came as like a submission, and I was like on the marketing table while we were reading it. And I think being like a Somali youth, the one thing that really gets lost in translation is understanding the story from your family. And like, I would give anything for my mom to sort of be as equipped with English as you are to share. Cause like you, when you're young, you hear these stories and you're like, oh, that's just Hoya talking again. That's Alba talking again. And you don't think it's interesting. But when they're able to speak in a language that you're familiar with and um, really hear the stories of how our country was beautiful before any like destruction or tribal mishaps hearing the beautiful stories and it comes from a very like elite family and hearing the story of like the elitism and like like beautiful homes and sort of like a somali princess almost you don't get to hear that and i think it's it's a incredible to have that sort of now marked in canadian literature in the canon and I was honored to be a part of it. So that's my endorsement for the youth to read the book. Thank you. So to go, to go along with that, we're only touching the miserable part of the story. So story is not only that. So you get the description of, um, some of you might not know, but how culturally wedding ceremonies are done. So that's well explained. And it is life before this, and even during her from a family where um, we were allowed to be who we were. My, my father had no formal education and he was a farmer, but he made sure my sister and I would educate as well as my brothers. That was, that was his, his really goal. And, uh, but, um, so I knew I could maybe go on and marry whoever I wanted, do whatever I wanted, but I always looked at social injustice. That first book I wrote about um, was was a book that looked at forced marriages and what happens to a girl when she's forced into a marriage. And those are different than arranged marriages. So I always looked at and examined social injustices, although I felt I was exempt from it on some level, that I wasn't I wasn't going to suffer the same fate as Idil did if I went that route. But at the same time, I always examine the social injustices and, and realize the challenges that, that women particularly had faced if they, if they went. So if a girl was forced into a marriage and she said no and married somebody else, it's the same consequences. So I, I always was aware of those social injustices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> we have one last question. And then we're gonna open the floor for food. Hi, please say your name and your question, please. Abdul Adha. Hey, how are you? So, uh, my question was, it was very interesting. I haven't read the whole book, but I've read it in parts, as you probably know. Yeah. I was interested to know how come you always call them mother and father? You never gave the parents' names. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I had, since this was done in a first person narrator, I first had a name for, for the mother and the father, and I think the editor of the publishing house thought that I should have a name for the mother and the father, but the challenge was in Somali culture, you never would, even in reference, use your mother's name. Um, so I thought if I introduced the name, I, wasn't, I wouldn't be able to divorce myself from it later on, because even in reference, even if Ida was selling something about her mother to somebody else, 
she would never use her mother's first name, right? Um, so so it's, it's a rare occasion where you use um, your mother's first name. For example, my kids would use my first name because my sister and I, they both call us mother. So if my sister and I were together, they have to use the first name to attach um, which mother they're referring to. So, but, so that's why I use the name mother as a name and capitalize so it becomes almost the mother and the father's name without the narrator using their name. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna, uh, we can't leave without bringing one person who's very special to us, especially in the Somali community. We have an ambassador uh, with us tonight who came to support the book lunch and support the community. We have Muhammad, Ambassador Muhammad Ali Noor, America. Please come. And he wants to say something. And and Somalia, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much um, to the ambassador, to everybody who came tonight. We're gonna, I'm just gonna, before I pass it to Sugri to wrap it up, uh, the food is, is opened. So we'll be eating. I know a lot of you are hungry because some people didn't eat the dinner. We're gonna eat food at the same time, we'll do the book signing. So whoever wants can go up and we can take and rotate. Thank you very much. We want to say thank you to Esther. And um, that food is from Esther. So enjoy, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to back to Shukr, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, tonight was a lovely evening uh, for Tomo Kuso. Uh, an ambassador is here. So basically, this book is already doing social change. Although, like, we don't have, seriously, the whole idea of, of taking this and talking about it um, uh, it's not good in a like a hishado in Somali, like um, It's good to talk about these topics, and I love the whole narrative that the person who's talking about it is within our people telling our own stories. I love that. Thank you very much. Abdikarim, AK Hormarka TV producer. Of course, um, everybody who's here, the Second Story Press and Talk Talk, Hood Hood, and Istad Restaurant. Mama Nakruma, we are blessed to have you with us all the time. Hassan, a special, special thanks to Hassan, because Hassan was part of the whole narrative change group. Uh, this is something he's pushing for. I'm proud of it, because we should be the ones telling our own stories. And Fortuma Kuso is a great example of that. And, and the special ambassador who came from all the way, I do appreciate you coming. And uh, like I said, it's a so social change. Yo, um, Musukulo Radhi I will just give uh, Fortuma back the mic. I, I'd like for her to do the closing. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out and for supporting um, this book. I really appreciate your support. And thank you for the organizers, sponsors, Hood Hood, Tap Talk, um, Second Story Press, it's the restaurant, um, and the Horror Market TV, and the radio for, for sponsoring and for helping me out launch the book. Um, thank you for you coming and buying the book and reading it and uh, supporting. Mukalka TV too, thank you very much. And now, uh, Hassan does not need an introduction. He facilitated this whole thing. Um, I'm extremely excited and it's such a pleasure to have this kind of narrative. We have been stuck 
in negative issues. And Hassan knows that the, most of the discussions that we've been having were surrounding negative aspects of our community. This is extremely positive, something beautiful to look forward to. Hassan. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. And especially, I just want to give um, the narrative change, the ch confronting the narrative. Uh, one of the biggest mentors of my mentor is Yermo Aghi, who is behind about the narrative change. I just want to give. I, I just want to give that. Uh, also, I just want to tell all over the world the people who are watching. This is the beginning, and we chose Toronto because Toronto is the Hollywood of the Somali community, <laughs> of diaspora, and every city we have a plan in, in, in going to Ohio, Minneapolis, Ottawa, um, Virginia. So we are putting a plan, and we we're going to travel and just make sure when we come to your city, you come and support us in terms of the book. And the whole idea is changing the narrative, confronting the narrative by writing our own narrative so that we don't want other uh, people to write for us. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you for Fortumo coming from all the way Windsor. And Windsor, we have it on, on no, November 16, right? 6th in Windsor. So if you are living in Windsor, we'll see you on November 6th. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
ilkenu aha walinahi waka Oh, I'm gonna go 